it will come as no great surprise to any of you in the audience here today that we, the human race, have had a huge impact on the world's oceans and the many species that live in them. Uh, and seeing the theme of this year's talks is impact, I want to talk to you about an invisible impact that we're having on marine life, and that's from human-introduced marine noise. So what is um, human-introduced marine noise, and, and how does it affect marine life? Well, it very much depends on the activity taking place. Almost everything we as humans do in the ocean generates some sort of noise. Uh, and this is on a, on a really big spectrum. At one end, we have extremely loud, high-frequency sounds, uh, like sonar. And this is hopefully an example of some sonar. Now, it's about to get a lot worse for any young ears in the audience. Uh, as we get older, we lose our ability to hear the top frequencies. And you're about to hopefully really experience some some nasty noises. <laughs> so, at the other end of the spectrum, we have lower and mid-frequency sounds. Uh, and in, in this case, this is an example of some shipping noise. Um, so this is from a container ship. So while this noise isn't quite as impactful or you know, initially quite as painful for us to listen to, over long periods of time, this kind of noise we call it chronic. Uh, and although it's a more subtle impact, it's an impact, impact nonetheless. And it's only very recently that we've fully become aware and begun to understand how this more chronic source of noise pollution can really affect marine life. And that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today. And one of the biggest producers, as I said, um, of this type of noise is from vessels. And to better explain to you all um, about how this kind of chronic noise pollution affects marine life, I'm going to be using the poster child of British Columbia, uh, or the killer whale, or to give them their last name, Orsinus orca. And so what many people don't know is that there are several different types of killer whale, but sec they're second only to ourselves in terms of their distribution around the planet. Um, they're found in all the world's oceans. And here in British Columbia, we have three different types of killer whale, or as we call them, ecotypes. And these are genetically, um, culturally, and physically very different types of killer whale. Because I don't have very much time today, I'm just going to be talking about one of these uh, types of killer whale, our resident type of killer whales. So these are fish-eating um, whales. And here we, in, in BC, we have two different populations. I'm going to be talking about the southern resident killer whales. Now, rather ironically, we know more about this population of whales than any other on the planet, probably. Um, but they're also some of the most endangered. Here, uh, it, around these waters, the Salish Sea, is their main summer residence area. They are currently numbering only 74 individuals. And this big guy here, this is Mike, or J26. They are split into three different families, these 74 whales. So they're partly called J, K, and L pod. And so Mike is a 26th member of J pod. Um, it was only in the 70s that we realized we had lots of different type, um, types of killer whales because a, a researcher called Michael, Dr. Michael Big, who this whale is named after, realized that all their fins are individually unique. And the saddle patch pigmentation, so this area here, is also unique to every individual whale. Killer whales are what we call sexually dimorphic, which means that one of the sexes is significantly bigger than the other. And in the killer whale's case, that's the males. Um, now listen up, guys, because in killer whale society, size literally does not matter. Um, it is a matriarchal society, and the females actually govern things. And so everybody's going to be thinking, OK, this is all really interesting, Lauren, but why are you telling us this? So I just want to try and get across to you how complex the social structure is with these animals. And one of the main ways that they maintain these communications between these family groups is through communication, and they do that by vocalizing. For anybody who hasn't heard what a killer whale sounds like, this is a recording of J-Pod. Um, of all our ecotypes of killer whales, they're their most vocal. They're very chatty whales. And while in the 70s we realized we could tell them all apart individually, physically, in the 80s, another researcher called Dr. John Ford realized that we could actually tell them all apart acoustically as well, uh, due to the unique sequences of calls that these family groups make. Again, I just want to emphasize, communication, sound, so important to these animals. But it's not just for communication. Uh, so killer whales are toothed whales, and in being that group, this particular group, they use echolocation um, to forage and navigate around their near pitch black environment. 
and the uh, brain bit that's not familiar with what echolocation is, that's when whales produce high frequency clicks and they are able to interpret the echo of that click hitting an object and from that they'll be able to tell where that object is and what that object is. So again, sound is super important to all aspects of their, of their lives. So what happens when we as human beings introduce noise into their environment? Well, it depends on the type of noise, it depends how loud that noise is, the frequency of the noise, how long the whales are exposed to that noise, and how close they are to that noise source. So if a whale is exposed to a very loud noise, something called a permanent threshold shift, or a PTS, can happen to them, which is essentially when they go deaf. Um, many of you here will have been to music concerts and festivals and be exposed to loud noise. And maybe the next day you have that kind of ringing and fuzziness in your ears, and over a couple of days, that will probably return to normal. And this is when you've experienced a temporary threshold shift in your hearing. And essentially the same thing happens to whales when they're exposed to loud noises. And many old rockers in the days before that you had to wear earbuds are now deaf because after night after night after night, they were exposed to loud noises. And again, the same thing happens to whales. But unfortunately, the thing is, when you are solely reliant on your hearing to survive, going deaf essentially means that you're a deaf, a deaf whale is a dead whale, is the phrase that a lot of people coin. So, again, although um, initially being exposed to a kind of relatively loud noise might not immediately result in a significant harm to that animal, with repeated exposure and over time, it can lead to a, a reduction in the health and a, a population level reduction as well. And it's actually one of the, in terms of southern resident killer whales, it's one of the main threats and now been identified um, that is stopping their recovery. So, again, if any of you live in the, here in the Salish Sea, it'll come as no great surprise to you this is a major threat, because in their habitat, we have a lot of vessel traffic going on. I also want to, at this point, acknowledge the fact that the thing that's really impactful about, about vessel traffic is that the frequency of noise that vessels produce it's the same frequency bands that the whales use for their calling, and something called acoustic masking happens. So this is a container ship, and you can hear the killer whale calling. Now, I can guarantee that every single one of you here in your daily lives has experienced at some point acoustic masking. If you've been in a busy sports stadium or in a restaurant and you're trying to be heard and you have to kind of wave to get your friend's attention, that's because something called masking is occurring. They can't hear you. But unfortunately, whales can't do that, right? They can't just go, oh, I'm over here. Um, please listen to me. But whales have come up with some really neat ways of trying to compensate for these increased background noise levels. Um, some species have increased the energy in their call, so they made them louder. Some have changed the frequencies in which they're calling at and some of them are calling more often. But the worrying thing with southern resident killer whales, their coping strategy has been to just stop calling altogether until it gets quieter. Now, anybody that lives here will know that those quiet times, they're not happening so, up, so very frequently anymore. Um, and that's a real issue. So despite over a decade of conservation efforts, the southern resident killer whales numbers are still in decline. And although their primary um, threat is from a lack of their key prey source, which is Chinook salmon, anything that reduces their ability to detect those fish, like we were discussing earlier, um, called listening space reduction, or the time that they spend looking for the fish, that can potentially have a huge impact on their lives. So I just want to finish today by saying, you know, when I got told the theme of this year's talks was impact, I googled the definition, and it gave me three different options. So the first was a striking of one thing against another, the second was an impinging, and the third was an influencing or an effect. When we talk about marine noise and southern resident killer whales, we could arguably be talking all three of these things. It's the striking of pressure waves against a, an, an animal um, that can re result in a physical um, harm to that, that individual. It's the impinging on their, their environment and reducing the distance over which they're capable of listening. And thirdly, it can result in an effect of their behavior and ability to carry out their life functions. So going forward, we as marine users are undoubtedly having an effect on their lives and we have to be more aware and put more effort into reducing the impact that we're having on their acoustic environment. That's it. Thank you.